In late 1999, the headquarters of Squaresoft would experience quite an anomaly. One of the most senior figures in the company, Hironobu Sakaguchi, who was working in Hawaii at the time, became obsessed with a recently released MMORPG, EverQuest. After becoming immersed in that game, he couldn't contain his desire to see an MMO developed by Square. He persisted through much of the company's skepticism, even convincing other developers to start EverQuest themselves. And before long, Sakaguchi wasn't the only one immersed in EverQuest. The EverQuest enthusiasm many of the Square developers had at the time eventually facilitated the excitement at the thought of making their own MMO, while many gaming companies would have had a hard time pivoting to develop something so different from what they usually work on, Square was different. During this time period, Square was known for being able to tackle many idiosyncratic projects from many different genres without compromising the quality of the final product. And no other video game series embodied Square's unique talent better than their flagship series, Final Fantasy. If you've made it even this far in the video, you probably know exactly why the Final Fantasy franchise is so beloved. You're also probably aware of the bafflingly high standard many fans hold the mainline series to. This insanely high standard did not dissuade Sakaguchi from making this novel, risky behemoth project the new flagship entry of the mainline Final Fantasy franchise. These strange times at Square culminated in January of 2000. On the 29th of that month, Square announced three mainline Final Fantasy games. The first was to celebrate all that Final Fantasy had been in the past. The second game was to demonstrate what Final Fantasy was capable of achieving in the present. The last Final Fantasy game was to give the world a look at what many developers at the time believed to be the future of the franchise. While the MMO genre today has somewhat fallen out of the mainstream compared to what it once was, in many ways, Eleven may have very well been a look into the future of Final Fantasy, more so than many Final Fantasy fans today might realize. The game launched on May 16th of 2002, and later outside of Japan, but the game players got at launch is very different from the game that we have today. The original storylines, setting, and gameplay loop are not near the quality of experience as the following Final Fantasy XI content. But to understand Final Fantasy XI, you can't simply disregard the original content of the game. Despite how rough it is comparatively, the entirety of Final Fantasy XI's seven expansions, six content add-ons, and two dozen years of content expanded upon this rough foundation in a way that's left the original content an essential part of the Final Fantasy XI experience, albeit with one notable flaw. The story for the first half of all three nation missions are mostly identical, and it focuses on the re-emergence of the Shadow Lord after his death. The Shadow Lord was the one responsible for the bloodiest enormity in recent Venadiel history, the Crystal War, which took place 20 years prior and ended with his death. He was the one who organized the Beastman forces against the Enlightened Races, and the prospects of his return send all of the nations into a desperate attempt to keep a conflict like the Crystal War from reigniting. The first half of each of these nation missions only deviate from each other insofar as they offer minimal foreshadowing for how each diverge in the second half, and those second halves really do step up the quality of storytelling considerably. The storyline of Sandoria revolves around two events concerning the D'Orgyle family. The first event is the return of a long-lost member of the family, and the second is the enactment of a hidden agenda that the primary leader in the Church of Sandoria has to open the Gate of the Gods. The main characters of the story are Tryon, Piaget, and Clady d'Orgyle, the children of the king. The story starts with each of these characters young, inexperienced, and unfit to rule the country they all deeply love. Throughout the story, each goes through struggles and hardships that tests their character. This is ultimately a coming-of-age story, and by the end of it, it's hard not to have grown a deep attachment to these characters. 
Bastok's narrative focuses on the re-emergence of the Galkan Tailkeeper and its implications for the relations between the Galka and the Humes. Final Fantasy fans are sure to recognize some of the characters in this story, such as Sid, the chief engineer of Bastok, and Gilgamesh, the infamous pirate of Norg. While seeing Eleven's version of these legacy characters was certainly a treat, the original characters of the story stand out far more. The fraternal bond between Valker, captain of the Mithril Musketeers, and Zide, slayer of the Shadow Lord, in particular, is one that was very well written. I did feel that Bastok's plot was the weakest between the three. It seems to struggle, weaving the different character arcs into one cohesive narrative, but this is mostly made up for thanks to how great these characters are. The story you play through in Windurst deals with the repercussions of a horrid and unholy magic the Federation was forced to use in order to survive the Crystal War. The narrative focuses on a powerful mage, Ajito, and Apuru, his younger sister. Unlike the Bastok story, however, both of these characters are too young to have had any major involvement in the Crystal War. As a consequence, the theme of atoning for the sins of the fathers feels recognizable here, but it offers plenty of twists on the idea to keep it fresh. This story in particular was my personal favorite of the three, and its conclusion was the most exciting. After finishing the base game, you'll unlock Rise of the Zillart, the first expansion, and you'll likely be at a sufficient level to start many of the other expansion stories. And the story that Final Fantasy XI has managed to tell over the years is so grand in its scope and epic in its proportions that it has very few equals. This story starts you off as an obscure adventure, but takes you to the ancient city in the sky the pocket dimension of the Altayu Mother Crystal, the labyrinthian ruins that stretch across the seafloor, the space beyond time and space, the root system of the world tree, and more. It is a phenomenon that, for me, will go down as one of the crowning achievements of the video game industry. The story starts with humble beginnings and ends with grandeur of epic proportions. However, the beginning is truly humble. In fact, a majority of those who get to experience the beginning either never continue or do with minimal attention to this grand story moving forward. Many of the cutscene techniques utilized in the second expansion and beyond had yet to be utilized or refined for the first couple narratives of Final Fantasy XI. This leaves the nation stories, especially the first half, to be far rougher than the rest of XI's story. Having the nation missions with the rudimentary cutscenes and dated pacing issues as the only story that can be progressed as you level from 1 to level 75 doesn't exactly welcome new players interested in the story, but recommending players skip the nation missions and go straight to the later expansions might be worse. While the nation missions aren't nearly as polished, they do offer some foundational world building and plot points that are continually referenced and built upon throughout the expansions. Rise of the Zillart fleshes out Zide's character even more so. The maturation of the Sandoria Sons has a really satisfying payoff in Treasures of Adargan, and both Chains of Promathia and Wings of the Goddess do so much to build off these original nation stories, especially Windursts. Regardless, the roughest part of Eleven's presentation is mostly limited to the first half of the nation stories. But why? What caused the second half of these stories to turn out far more polished than the first? Well, the second half of the nation stories actually came out after the release of the first expansion. You may find this odd. Why finish a story of one content piece after the release of another? Well, Square's tendency to blur the lines between content pieces applied to more than just the story. Throughout my time reviewing the expansions of Eleven, I've been very insistent on including almost all of the content pieces from each expansion in the respective video. This is so that new players who are interested in delving into the content other than the story are able to engage with the content across their journey through the expansions 
rather than pushing them all off till after all of the story. Trying to divide up the 11 content neatly into expansions, however, has proved to be rather difficult and a bit arbitrary at times. So in the following videos of this series, I may reference a piece of content for an expansion despite that piece of content coming out during a completely different era. And this is also why you may have heard some players recommend skipping the second half of the Nation missions when playing through the main story. The second half did come out after the original era had ended, but as I mentioned, you do get so much more out of the story if you finish whichever Nation story you start. Final Fantasy XI took several decisive steps away from the series' gameplay traditions into what the developers at the time thought to be the future of the Final Fantasy series. Random encounters? Not anymore. Turn-based combat? Nope. World maps? That was so last year. Whenever the topic of Final Fantasy XI comes up, many like to point out how drastic of a departure it is from the series that it's a part of. What I find equally, if not more interesting, however, is just how much stayed the same despite the change in the game's genre. And nothing exemplifies this better than the combat system of the game. While XI has a lot of old-school MMO elements, Final Fantasy XI takes a lot of inspiration from the 2D-era Final Fantasy games as well. When starting the game, you choose a job. The six starting jobs that you can pick from are the same six jobs from the original Final Fantasy game. The skill system from the second Final Fantasy game makes a triumphant return in 11-2, requiring players to utilize particular skills to become more proficient at them. Similar to Final Fantasy III, you can change between jobs anytime you choose. And finally, mixing job abilities in Final Fantasy V has an analog in the form of Final Fantasy XI's sub-jobs. So for those who feel that this combat is a complete departure from everything the series had been before, well, you're somewhat right, but not entirely. There are still many elements that Final Fantasy fans will deeply appreciate. As far as the rest of the combat, this game's combat system is one of the most strategic in the series. While it starts out slow, by the time you reach the higher levels and learn your job, it feels anything but slow. Any job you choose to play will have a set of traits, a set of abilities, and a set of aptitudes towards magic spells and weapons. The job traits are passive changes to your jobs, and while they are passive, they have an enormous impact on the way each job plays. The job traits are one of the ways that Final Fantasy XI keeps its jobs from feeling homogenized, and just from the jobs I've leveled, each feels dramatically different. The job abilities are where much of your agency in combat comes in. These abilities complement whatever the design of the job is. Dark Knight, the job I've spent the most time on, is a damage dealer with heavy emphasis on stealing attributes from the enemy. As a result, the Dark Knight has abilities like Blood Weapon, which steals HP from the enemy, or Soul Enslavement, which steals TP from the enemy. We'll get to TP in a moment. The Dark Knight also has one of its signature moves, Soul Eater, which consumes the player's HP to make your own attack more powerful. Other jobs such as Blue Mage can steal enemy abilities and use them as magical spells, just like Final Fantasy V. Summoners have job abilities having to do with commanding their avatars or summons. The uniqueness of the jobs extend beyond just their abilities, though. Each job has a particular aptitude for certain weapons and magic. The Dark Knight has high aptitude for using scythes and great swords. Black mages have high aptitude for elemental magic, and rangers have high aptitude for marksmanship. If your job has high aptitude for a certain skill, that makes your job more effective when utilizing abilities associated with that skill. For example, because Red Mage has a higher aptitude for elemental magic than Dark Knight, Red Mage often gets more elemental spells and they're far stronger when Red Mage casts them. But because the Dark Knight has a higher aptitude for dark magic, Dark Knights will often have access to more of these dark magic spells and will be more effective at casting them. This also applies to the weapons in the game, so increasing your combat skills for the weapons of your class is especially important for melee classes for a similar reason. You accrue tactical points, or TP, upon every successful auto-attack, 
Once you have over 1000 TP built up, you can use a weapon skill associated with the weapon you have equipped. The more tactical points you have when popping the weapon skill, the more powerful it will be. Every weapon in the game has a different set of weapon skills, and it's usually advantageous to have access to as many different weapon skills as your job will allow, because you can freely swap between equipment at any time. The reason you want as many weapon skills as possible is due to the skill chain and magic burst systems, which just like in my first video on the topic, I'll refer to as the skill burst system. Every weapon skill has an associated skill chain property associated with it. If you time two weapon skills, one after the other, and their properties synergize, you start a skill chain. There are certain job-specific abilities that also have skill chain properties, such as physical blood packs for summoners and certain blue magic abilities for blue mages. Timing more weapon skills, whose properties are compatible, will extend the skill chain and boost the damage dealt. Each skill chain property has an associated element. If an elemental spell of the same element as the skill chain is cast, this results in a magic burst. The damage done by the spell will be enhanced by a significant percent, and that percentage can be increased depending on the skill chain that facilitated said magic burst. Much of the combat in this game involves coordinating all of your abilities to minimize the damage taken by your party while setting up for the most effective skill bursts as possible. There is still so much to go over in regards to the skill burst system, such as special weapon skills, skill chain levels, effects of equipment and job traits, and more. But I hope my explanation was enough to give you an idea of just how strategic this combat system is. While the combat can be excruciatingly slow at the start of the game, you'll find yourself overwhelmed with how many things you need to be doing and keeping track of in the later levels if you don't take the time to learn the combat at lower levels. Another important factor to the combat is the Alter Ego system. An Alter Ego, also called a Trust, is an NPC party member that you can summon after unlocking, and you can summon up to five of these depending on which missions you've already finished. Learning how all of the different alter egos behave in battle is often an overlooked dimension to the combat system, simply because this system is relatively new to the game. However, certain story fights later on require a very specific alter ego setup depending on the player's job. While I haven't beaten every story boss up until the end of the main story solo, I have beaten most of them, and I've also talked to players who have, and they did so with only the subpar equipment that you can purchase from NPCs. If you aren't taking the time to learn all of the Trust's strengths and weaknesses, you'll probably find many doable fights completely impossible. This, in my opinion, is a testament to how strategic the Alter Ego system is, even if playing with other players, rather than NPCs, is often more effective. The distinct job identity, skill burst system, and Alter Ego system all come together to form what I consider to be one of the best combat systems in the series. The sheer complexity of the combat system also transformed grinding sessions into experimentation sessions, where I'd summon and learn different alter egos, explore the skill burst systems available to me, and learn how best to utilize my abilities. By the time you get to level 99, you have a solid idea of what your job can do, as well as how to coordinate your job with the trusts that you use. You really do feel like you've come a long way from level 1, but unfortunately, very few players going through the story will ever get to experience this for one unfortunate reason. The first four expansions of the game were designed and launched while the game's level cap was at 75. Today, trying to play through these expansions at level 99 trivializes all of the boss fights, making these otherwise incredibly designed fights impossible to appreciate. Worse still, players who get to level 99 before playing through the game's story can get through a majority of the game's story without ever really engaging with the game's combat system. And when new players do reach the more difficult story bosses, they often just request support from overpowered players, which again, removes the intricacy of the combat system. To be clear, the problem isn't with new players, they're just simply playing the game. The problem is with the way the content has been modernized. While the stories of each of these expansions are most certainly worth playing, the experience of playing through the stories is only enjoyable if players purposefully avoid raising their own level cap beyond around level 80. This is all to say that the vast majority of players who simply play through the story and never engage with Endgame will have a very difficult time enjoying this incredible combat system.
While we're on the topic of levels, I do want to discuss the leveling process of Final Fantasy XI. It is still really common to find people referring to the level cap of XI as level 99. While this might technically be true, it certainly isn't practically true. XI is an old-school MMO, which means that to get to max level will require hundreds and hundreds of hours of grinding. The true level cap at the time of making this video is Master Level 50. How long does it take to get to M level 50? Well first, you need to get to normal level 50. Easy enough, this can be done in a little over a dozen hours on a fresh character if you're a very quick learner and you take the time to get the key items that speed up XP gains. At this point, you need to start doing limit break quests to unlock every following five levels for a total of 10 limit break quests. Some of these are trivial, others can be quite time consuming. If you stick with it though, you'll hit level 99 and be strong enough to play through what most consider to be the main story of Final Fantasy XI, without too much difficulty, until the later game that is. But you aren't at max level yet. You aren't even halfway there. The next leg of your journey will require you to achieve Job Master. This means you'll need to farm 2100 job points. To earn 2100 job points, you'll be farming capacity points which you start earning from monsters once you hit level 99. You'll also be farming limit points, which convert to merit points, and they'll speed up the entire process. You can actually start farming merit points at level 75, however, it is far more effective to farm your merit points and job points at the same time. The time it takes to get to 2100 job points and master your job dwarfs the time it takes to get to level 99. The grind to get to job master is truly a monumental one. But if you stick with it, congratulations, you are almost to the halfway point. Now that you've mastered your job, you are officially at M level 0. You need to start farming exemplar points to increase your master level. And just like the job point grind dwarfed the level 99 grind, the grind from M level 0 to M level 50 is the harshest max level grind Final Fantasy XI has ever seen. There are few caveats though. I've heard of rumors of future accessories that even more so increase the rate of exemplar points earned. This could shorten the grind tremendously. The second caveat is that there is no content exclusively designed for max level in the game. Most of the game's most challenging content can be done at lower levels. I'll also reiterate, all of the game's story content can be handled all the way back at level 99. So if the story is what you want, you won't have to engage with this grind but it is there for those who want to experience it. Final Fantasy XI offers a wide variety of beautiful zones that have been crafted over the 20 years of this game's life cycle. The original set of zones are clearly not to the same quality as the later zones, but they do have a certain charm to them. I found the art style in particular for these original zones to be quite good, and it kept exploration and the discovery of every next zone interesting. The highlights of these original zones, however, are the notorious monsters placed throughout. Notorious monsters, or NMs as they're referred to, are stronger monsters with special spawn conditions and more valuable drops. The reason NMs add so much to the zones of Final Fantasy XI is because they oftentimes require further engagement with the game world than does the story. For instance, the Empress Hairpin is a piece of headgear that would make leveling certain jobs much smoother for a couple hours of grinding. The Empress Hairpin only drops from the Valkram Emperor, a notorious monster in Valkram Dunes. This NM's spawn method is called a lottery spawn, which means you have to repeatedly hunt a particular monster type and wait for the monster type to respawn. There is a chance that rather than the normal monster spawning, the NM spawns instead. Lottery spawns aren't the only type of NM spawning though. There are multiple methods for different NMs and each has you engage with these zones in a unique way. If you want a list of NMs in an area, you can pick up quests to hunt any NM from the hunt registries added later on in the game's life, and they reward you with a special currency if you take out the NM you registered for. The entire process is akin to the hunts that the Final Fantasy series has taken a liking to after this entry and it really brings the game world to life for those who engage with it.
the quest structure of Final Fantasy XI is one that many players take issue with. For the nation missions in the first expansion, there is very little interaction with the world outside of talking to NPCs or trading drops to special locations. The things that the game has you doing are relatively uninteresting and monotonous. This does change substantially by the second expansion, where the gameplay is more varied and creative, but this lack of variety in the gameplay early on isn't the only issue people have with the quest structure. The sheer ambiguity of how to do every mission, quest, or activity can be excruciating for new players. I would be glad to grab an orcish axe and deliver it back. But where do I find one? This game gives the player so little in terms of direction on how to start missions, how to accomplish missions, and everything in between. This essentially means that any player going through the story will be heavily reliant on external walkthroughs and guides for the story. I myself don't mind this at all, but I have met plenty of people who feel that this is unfair or it's cheating to be referencing a guide during their playthrough. I want to address this feeling. It is important to note that the ambiguity in the quest structure for Final Fantasy XI was a deliberate choice to get players to interact with the game's community. A new player in the Golden Era would just go and ask a more experienced player where to find an orcish axe and move on. Since the game's population isn't nearly what it once was, the best way to interact with the community for the older story content is not to engage with the community directly, but to engage with what the community has produced. This is precisely why I, as someone who dislikes relying on guides for almost every other game, don't mind using a guide for this game at all. Using an external guide is suboptimal. It's immersion breaking and it takes time to get used to. But once you're adjusted, it's only slightly more inconvenient than having quest markers and tutorials up on the screen at all times. And it's certainly not an illegitimate way of enjoying the game. The music for the original soundtrack was primarily composed by three different people. From what I could find, Naoshi Mizuda is the biggest contributor to this soundtrack and the Final Fantasy XI soundtrack as a whole. Just like legendary Final Fantasy composer Nobuo Uematsu, who has also contributed to the soundtrack, Mizuda has the skill of composing strong melodies without compromising on their fit for an intended use. This is an attribute that the Final Fantasy series' music has lost since Uematsu has been joined by other composers in Final Fantasy X. To be clear, I don't think the quality of music in Final Fantasy has suffered from this change, but it has changed, and hearing music like that found in this soundtrack is a wonderful refreshment from the more modern Final Fantasy games. Nobuo Uematsu's influence on the soundtrack is tough to miss for those of us who love his work, Uematsu is, in my opinion, the greatest video game composer of all time, and his contributions here maintain that quality. While Kumi Tanioka would not come back to work on the soundtrack of Eleven after this original soundtrack, I have a hard time denying that the music of this game lost something with her departure. The original music has a particular feel to it that's distinct from everything else, yet difficult to describe. The work of these three composers resulted in an incredible soundtrack that would continue to be used throughout the entirety of the game. Now, if you've listened closely up until this point, you may have noticed something. A discussion about the Final Fantasy XI base game almost always invokes the way it is either changed or improved over time. For those who have never tried Final Fantasy XI, this might not be noteworthy at all. It's understandable that an MMO would improve over time. But for new players of modern Final Fantasy XI, they point to the one notable flaw of the base game. This flaw is notable and widespread, not because the story is really that bad or because the zones aren't as exciting as they would wind up being, or because the combat system isn't as dynamic until the higher levels, no. In fact, the one notable flaw that touches on everything is hardly a flaw at all. 
The issue with the base game is that it's simply a massive barrier to entry for new players. The stories are quite good, but it's also notably worse than the stories found in the rest of the game. The combat between levels 1 and the higher levels can be enjoyable, but not nearly as enjoyable as when you do reach the higher levels. The zone design is solid, but none of the zones in the base game capture the grandeur of sky or sea. Many players I've known spend several dozen hours with the nation missions and the combat at lower levels, and they quit. The true travesty of this is that it keeps thousands of curious players from experiencing the incredible highs of Final Fantasy XI, and XI is a game worth experiencing. This game has a core story that spans a base game and six following expansions. It has a soundtrack with 230 incredible pieces. It has a breathtaking collection of zones that vary widely in their layout, art direction, and topography. It has 20 years worth of incredible and enjoyable content. And it has shaped the mainline Final Fantasy series far more than it ever gets credit for. Final Fantasy XI is among the very best entries in a series celebrated for being full of timeless classics and masterpieces. Time hasn't been kind to many of the design choices and systems, but that does not detract from the masterful story it manages to tell, the enormous cast of characters it has shaped, and all of the different ways in which it allows you to enjoy its world. It's a beautiful piece of art that deserves to have its legacy remembered. There is much in the discourse about this game that has been left unsaid, many conversations that were never had, and achievements that have yet to be acknowledged. So, if I may, I ask that you join me as I go over the modern experience of all of the following expansions, their stories, gameplay, highs, and lows. I'm fully aware that I've already spent a lot of time talking about this game in this video, but trust me, we have hardly scratched the surface.